Okay, so we're going to go through paper six, which is the alternative to the practical for chemistry. This is IGCSE for, from Cambridge International Examination, CIE, and this is from May, June 2017, variant one, so 0620 slash 61. All right, let's begin. So, shall we get started? Question one. A student prepared strontium nitrate crystals. The diagram shows some of the stages of this pre preparation. Okay, so they started off and they had some dilute acid. They added some strontium carbonate solid, and then they mixed it up. And then at the end, there was a little bit of unreacted solid, and then they had strontium nitrate solution. All right, so complete the box to identify the apparatus. So this is a glass rod. You can also call it a stirrer. I just like the word glass rod better. Okay, sounds a bit, bit nicer. All right, A2. What is used to add the strontium carbonate to the acid in stage one? Well, that is a spatula. Okay. Three, name the dilute acid used. Okay, so it created strontium nitrate from strontium carbonate, so it had to be something with that could create nitrate, so it would be nitric acid. Four, give one expected observation in stage two. Okay, stage two is where, where we're adding, having a carbonate react with an acid, and when that happens, you get bubbles. Another nice word you could use is called effervescence which is just a fancy way of saying bubbles. What you cannot say is a gas is given off because a gas is saying, if you said a gas is given off, that would not give you any marks because that is not an observation. You know it is a gas, but what you're, you're not seeing a gas, a gas is invisible. You're seeing the bubbles, the effervescence. Okay, so make sure when you put an observation, you say what you see or hear or smell or something like that, not what you know. B, why is heat not necessary in stage two? Well, the reason why heat is not necessary is because the reaction happens fast enough as it is when it's at room temperature. So the reaction occurs quickly at room temperature. So we don't need to add extra heat. So C, which of the reactants is in excess and explain your answer. Well, you know that strontium carbonate is in excess because there is a solid left behind at the end. The strontium carbonate was left behind at the end as a solid. Okay, if it was a nitric acid that was in, in excess, all of the solid would be dissolved. So the strontium carbonate is in excess as there is solid left behind. And D, describe how crystals of strontium nitrate could be obtained from the mixture in stage three. Okay, so the strontium carbonate and the nitric acid have reacted and you have a solution of strontium nitrate. Okay, to get some strontium nitrate crystals, what you have to do is first filter out the strontium carbonate that was unreacted. Okay, so once you've filtered out the remaining unreacted strontium carbonate, you need to heat to evaporate some of the water. Okay, so how much do you heat it? How much water do you evaporate? Well, you heat it until it reaches a sat the saturation point. Okay, so you filter out the remaining unreacted strontium carbonate, then you heat the solution to evaporate some water until it reaches saturation point. Okay, and you can test to see if it's reached saturation point by using a glass rod test. That's where you put the glass rod into the hot water and you put it on a cold slide, a cold microscope slide, and you look at it under the microscope to see if you can see little crystals formed. Okay, and that's how you can get crystals of strontium nitrate. You don't want to heat it until all the water is evaporated though. And the reason why you don't want to heat it till all the water's evaporated is because the crystals will be really, really, really tiny. You want it to be, you want, they, they ask for crystals, they probably want them large enough so you can see. So they want it to evaporate slowly. Question two. A student investigated the reaction between aqueous sodium thiosulfate and two different aqueous solutions of potassium iodate, iodate labeled solution C and solution D. And two experiments were carried out. So the first experiment, experiment one, a burette was filled with aqueous sodium thiosulfate and the initial burette readings were, reading was recorded. 
Using a measuring cylinder, 20 centimeters cubed of solution C, that contained potassium iodate, okay, were poured into a conical flask. 10 centimeters cubed of dilute sulfuric acid and one gram of potassium iodide were added to the flask to form a solution of iodine because iodine doesn't really dissolve on its own very easily without the acid. The flask was swirled to mix the contents. Aqueous sodium thiosulfate was slowly added from the burette to the flask and swirled to mix thoroughly. When the contents of the flask turned pale yellow, starch solution was added and the solution turned blue-black. Okay, because blue, black, blue-black is a color that the solution turns when, you, when it reacts with the iodine. So more aqueous sodium thiosulfate was then added slowly to the flask until the solution just turned colorless. The final burette reading was recorded. Okay, and then question part A, use the burette diagrams to record the readings in the table and complete the table. Okay, so it's a long, complicated description. However, this bit should be nice and straightforward. But make sure you're clear. Final is here and initial here. Don't just assume the first one's initial. Read the question. Okay, so the final reading is, this is 38, 38.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So this is 38.3 centimeters cubed, and centimeters cubed is already in the heading. The initial burette reading is over here. That's 4.1 centimeters cubed. Okay, and if you subtract 4.1 from 38.3, you get 34.2 centimeters cubed. All right. Experiment two, the conical flask was emptied and rinsed with distilled water. Experiment one was repeated using solution D instead of solution C, so just a different concentration of the potassium iodate. Use the burette diagrams to record the readings in the table and complete the table. Okay, so again, the final reading is this one over here, and that is 20.8 centimeters cubed. Okay, and the initial reading is 3.7 centimeters cubed. Okay, and the difference is 17.1. Okay, fantastic. That should be some easy marks as long as you can read the burette. C1, which solution of potassium iodate, solution C or solution D, is the more concentrated? Explain your answer. Okay, so solution C took 34.2 centimeters cubed, this was C, and this is solution D, took 17.1 centimeters cubed. Okay, so if we look at this, solution C is more concentrated and that's because it took more sodium thiosulfate to react with the potassium iodide, iodate for solution C. Okay, Okay. So, so solution C is more concentrated because a greater volume of thiosulfate was needed. Okay, so how many more times concentrated is this solution of potassium iodate? Okay, so 34.2 divided by 17.1 equals 2. So this is 2 times as concentrated. All right. And then last bit, D, predict the volume of aqueous sodium thiosulfate which would be needed to react completely with 30 cent centimeters cubed of solution D. Okay, so th 30 centimeters cubed is about 1.5 times more than 20.8 centimeters cubed. So the volume needed It's a prediction, so it's not going to be perfect. Equals 17.1 centimeters cubed times 1.5, which equals 25.7 centimeters cubed. Okay, so the prediction is that it would take about 25.7 centimeters cubed to react completely with 30 centimeters cubed of solution D. All right. E1, state two sources of error in this experiment. Okay, so one of the big sources of error is that they used a measuring cylinder to measure solutions C and D. 
Okay, and two is suggest two improvements to reduce the source of error in E1. So the improvement for using a measuring cylinder would be to use either a pipette or a burette. Choose one. Okay, so one of the sources of error is using a me measuring cylinder to measure solution CND, and you can improve that by using a pipette instead to measure CND. Okay, another source of error is that they only did the experiment once. As we all know, that's generally not good enough. All right, and the obvious improvement for this source of error is to repeat the experiment twice. Okay, so they only did the experiment once, so they can improve it by repeating the experiment twice. Repeating it twice means that they do it once, and then they repeat twice, so that they do three trials in total, and that's a good number to get an average. All right, remember, a source of error that is not, again, that is not human error. You cannot say you measured it wrong. Measure it better next time. That is not, you can't improve that, that's just a mistake. That's why you repeat it. So do not put that down. Question three. Two solids, E and F, were analyzed. Solid F was potassium iodide. Tests were carried out on each solid, and some of the ob observations on solid E were, are, are shown. Okay, so we know what solid F is, but we're going to look at solid E first, that we don't know what it is. Okay, so first of all, it is a green solid. Well, there's not many things that are green solids, but okay, we'll use that just to double check at the end. Okay, test one, solid E was heated gently and then strongly, and the solid turned black. Okay, so it, heat, it turned black when, when it was heated. Okay, test two, dilute sulfuric acid was added to solid E, and it had rapid effervescence. Okay, if you notice, I didn't say a gas was given off. They said effervescence or bubbles. All right, so the gas given off was tested, and the observation was that lime water turned milky. Well, lime water turned milky is a classic test for carbon dioxide. And then excess aqueous ammonia was added to the mixture in the test tube. And that produced a pale blue precipitate, which then dissolved as they added more ammonia to form a dark blue solution. Okay, so that is actually the result for copper 2 plus. Okay, for copper. Okay, so it starts as a light blue precipitate, which is soluble in excess ammonia, and it forms a dark blue solution. So that sounds like copper carbonate. But we'll, we have one final test. And a flame test was carried out on solid E, and that produced a blue-green color. Okay, so the blue-green color is copper. All right, so let's see what the questions are. A. Test 1 states that the solid should be heated gently and then strongly. In terms of safety, explain why it is necessary to heat gently at first. Okay, there's a couple of reasons. It might be that the solid spits out of the tube. Okay, another possible reason is that if you heat a cold test tube strongly, it might crack. Okay, so choose one of these. There's only one mark, so you should only put one of these down. But you can say either the solid will spit out of the tube, or maybe it will react very violently or something like that. Or you can say the test tube might crack because you're heating it from cold to really hot very suddenly, and glass will crack in that situation. B. Identify the gas given off in test two. Well, the gas given off in test two, as we said, is it's the lime water test, and we use lime water to see when lime water turns milky, that's a test for carbon dioxide. So that's carbon dioxide, okay? And identify solid E, okay, so we had carbon dioxide given off, and we had some copper, so the solid has to be copper carbonate. Okay, good. So now we're looking at tests on solid F. And remember, solid F, they already told you, was potassium iodide. Okay, so we need to complete the expected observations. So first of all, we want to describe the appearance of potassium iodide. And potassium iodide is basically it's white crystals or you just say it's white distilled water was added to solid f in a test tube and shaken to dissolve solid f 
E1. To the first portion of the solution, an excess of aqueous sodium hydroxide was added. And what do you see when you add excess aqueous sodium hydroxide to potassium iodide? You don't really see anything, so there's really no change. There really should be no change. And E2. To the second portion of the solution, dilute nitric acid and aqueous silver nitrate were added. With that, you should actually see a yellow precipitate. All right, good. So F, a flame test was carried out on solid F. So the observations for a flame test for potassium is the flame is lilac. So you get a, li a lilac flame. And the lilac flame that is not purple and it's not mauve. Okay, it's lilac. That's the word they like to see. Okay, you'll get it marked wrong if you say it's a purple flame or a mauve flame, even if they really look about the same. Okay, so it's a lilac flame. Okay, G. Describe how you would carry out a flame test. Okay, so first of all, you'd have to get a metal wire, generally a nichrome wire, which is in a bit of a loop. And you want to make sure it's, it's clean. You don't want any other solid on there. So you clean it using concentrated hydrochloric acid. Okay, so you clean a metal wire with concentrated hydrochloric acid. And you have to word, put the word concentrated in there because you can't have dilute. It doesn't really work as well with dilute. Okay, so then you dip the wire into, into the powder you're testing and you place it into a roaring flame. Okay, so you dip the wire into the powder you're testing and place it into a roaring flame. And the keyword there is roaring. You want it a nice, strong flame. And you could say it's a blue flame. You could even say it's a strong flame, but it's, it, you want to be specific. Roaring or blue would be better because the blue flames are the really hot flames. Question four. A sample of furniture cleaner contains aqueous sodium chloride, aqueous ammonia, and sand. A. Give a test to show the presence of ammonia in the mixture. Okay, so ammonia turns red litmus blue. That red litmus turns blue. You shouldn't really use the smell test because yes, you can smell ammonia, but it might might get confused with some other chemicals, and it's a very strong smell. So it's it's safer to to use a litmus rather than take a big waft of the of the smell okay b plan an investigation to obtain a sample of pure water from the mixture okay to obtain pure water from the mixture you have to heat the mixture until it boils and then you can condense the vapor okay so you heat the mixture until it boils and condense the vapor all right if you want to obtain pure sand from the mixture first of all you have to filter the sand from the mixture and then you wash the sand with water to make sure that there's no salt or ammonia still left on it, no residue left on it. And then you dry it and then you have pure sand. Okay, so you filter the sand from the mixture, you wash the residue with water and then you dry the sand. All right, and that is a total of six marks for that, that entire question. And it's also the end of this exam. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please press the like and the, and the thumbs up. And if you have any other questions or comments or anything else you'd like us to go over, please write them in the comments below and we'll go over them as soon as we can. And have a great day.